Hello, everyone. My name is Griff Courtney. I am the Director of Engagement and Business Development at ASN. Here I have John Applezon with me today. Uh, he is our inaugural leader for our upcoming series called Meet the Leader, where we will interview a high profile ASN member um, consisting in various uh, gems and risses. So, um, John, you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm John Applezon. Um, I'm the Director of uh, the um, Clinical Nutrition Lab at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. I've been here for, eh, give or take, probably almost 10 years now, eight, eight, nine, ten, 10, somewhere in through there. And prior to that, um, I was did my um, PhD at Purdue in Foods and Nutrition, and then went on and did uh, one postdoc at the uh, Medical College of Georgia uh, in basic science, and then came here to uh, do my second and have um, moved up the ladder. That sounds great. So um, kind of walk me through the early phase of, uh, of your life. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? How did you get to where you are today? Well, I was pretty much um, born and raised in Indiana. So um, I was um, born in Indianapolis and pretty much stayed there um, clear till moving uh, more or less almost for my postdoc. Um, so we um, we grew up near Indianapolis, Indiana, and I pretty much stayed um, in the same school system through um, there. Uh, it really was in middle school is where I got an interest in science. Um, I was a member of, it was at the time, uh, the member of Science Olympiad, so I had a, in a variety of other um, interests in uh, junior high and middle school, and it just kind of progressed from there. Um, and in high school, I had a, a lot of interest in science as well. I went to uh, undergrad originally uh, to major in biology and thought, oh, this really isn't for me. And so then I actually switched to exercise physiology. My undergrad is in exercise physiology. And, um, but midway through, I got a job at the, in the uh, metabolic research kitchen at Purdue. And so um, it was actually this job that took me to get my PhD in foods and nutrition, um, working, uh, I did, worked in the metabolic research kitchen there as an undergrad uh, under the direction of um, Wayne Campbell. And so I just continued on from uh, there and stayed in uh, foods and nutrition after developing an interest in uh, nutrition while working there. I prepared all the foods um, in the morning for a variety of uh, participants. They were um, full meal provision. And so I'd pack up meals for up to 10 to 12 participants in a day. That sounds awesome. And with uh, your exercise physiology background, is that kind of what carried over your interest to, um, you know, a macronutrient metabolism? Um, and what is it? Um, sorry, let, let me say that one more time. I want to get that right. Energy and macronutrient metabolism. Okay. It, it did. It was uh, the combination of exercise physiology and the nutrition that really um, kind of blended this interest in energy and macronutrient metabolism. And so, um, and in metabolism in general, um, as, as I've taken off in my career, I think they're um, critically important. And um, it's just kind of all is fed together into, it's kind of a reverse funnel, if you will, uh, fed into this overall interest. That's great. Um, when did you join ASN? I actually joined ASN, I think, in my, um, perhaps in my first or second year of graduate school. So it's been actually, ASN's been my core um, co conference as well as uh, membership um, through early in my uh, career. It's been the, the one um, society that I've been a member of the longest um, and, and, has had, and have had probably continual membership since probably 03 or 04 or somewhere in through there. Um, and ever since then, I've been a member and I've been attending the conferences and been an active member throughout. That's great. That's what we love to hear. Um, so did you join uh, your RIS as soon as you joined ASN? And kind of tell me what the energy and macronutrient metabolism RIS looked like when you first joined and kind of how it evolved to get to where it is today. I think, honestly, it was the first RIS I joined uh, when, when I joined way back when. And it's one of those things where my uh, research has matured, but it has stayed in the overall uh, similar um, theme, if that makes sense. There, there's been some, um, there's been some deviation, but overall, there's still that I'm still an active member, and my research still um, overarches in the energy and macronutrient metabolism world. 
So it's kind of one of those things where lots of people deviate throughout their career. And I definitely have some deviations, but I definitely have uh, continued on the same trajectory. So it, um, I remember early on, it was one of those, um, it was just a, a way to ke uh, meet key members that you um, were, meet, were, you were uh, reading their papers and you were doing different things and incorporating their work into your manuscripts. But uh, by engaging in the RIS, that was oftentimes in the RIS uh, meetings was often a time when you actually got to meet uh, some of the more mid-career and senior members that you were um, citing in your papers as a graduate student and um, different things like that, that you didn't have an opportunity to necessarily interact with um, it, at times other than that. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Um, can you expand on uh, your current research activities, kind of share with us what you're working on, um, any uh, studies that have come to completion or, you know, what's, uh, what, what's on your future agenda? Like many people, there's a lot on the plate and there's always more coming on. Um, so it, like everything, the, um, the research agenda is, um, I'm trying to think what all, we have, um, I have an ongoing collaboration in, uh, in R01 uh, that's ongoing. Then there's, we, um, multiple um, co-investigator studies. Um, I'm trying to think, there's some industry work that's all and a USDA project, all that's currently ongoing with more projects, of course, always in the pipeline, including industry studies. Some of them is we have some M health work going on. Um, that's a lot uh, that's um, pretty innovative. Um, that's allowing us to really um, give real time feedback to users um, uh, by letting them know what they're eating in real time. Uh, they take a picture and then they actually get feedback as to what they're using and things like that. And that's collaboration um, with Corby Martin. Then we also have a lot going on in the food waste realm where we're looking at um, how different, uh, you know, um, how the energy and macronutrients are interacting with household food waste and how to prevent that. Um, then there's some uh, weight management um, studies that are ongoing. Uh, specifically um, that I'm a co eye on with Leanne in terms of gestational weight gain and things like that. And then there are some studies, um, some other industry funded studies. And those are just some of the studies that are ongoing that I have uh, in my lab that are coming to mind at the moment. Nice, nice. Probably more. Yeah, probably more, but very exciting nonetheless. Um, now we're going to jump into uh, the publications. So th th thanks for sharing those, uh, those research activities with me. That's all very interesting. Um, have you been published recently? We, yeah, like grants and publications are pretty much all we do. Um, ongoing all the time and always under review. So we, um, the, the grants, if, if we have grants under review, we also have grants that are under peer review and then the grants that'll go in, of course, the June 5 deadline. And then the same with publications, we have them um, out uh, in, in preparation and we're constantly publishing a variety of work. And then also in co-author revision and a variety of other things. So um, pretty much, you know, multiple times a year that we we're always um, publishing manuscripts in a wide variety of journals, including the ASN journals. That's great. How has that uh, helped your career? Oh, it's great. It, it's feast or famine. <laughs> it's all or nothing if we don't have if we don't have. So one of the things I guess I should have mentioned at the very beginning is uh, Pennington Biomedical. It's a biomedical research center. So. Um, Unlike most ASN members, I don't have um, I don't have undergrad students and I don't have graduate students. So we're at a unique facility that has a lot of positives, but it just makes us a little bit different. As in, we're we're part of the Louisiana State University system, and we're a branch of the LSU system, but we're not technically um, like in uh, a, a facility, if you will, like a teaching facility. So. Um, it is considered a soft money position. So I bring in all my uh, own money for my salary or a good percentage of it, if that makes sense. And then um, through grants and, and things like that, as opposed to through teaching, um, like many other uh, people do. And then with that, since we're not an academic institution, we don't have um, undergraduate or graduate students. Some people do get graduate students from LSU, but we have, uh, we're primarily have postdocs here at the center. So it, there's a good percentage. I think we have about 30 postdocs at the moment in the center, and that's who does a lot of our work. Um, forget what the original question was, but I wanted to give a little bit of a, a better understanding of the, what the Biomedical Research Center was 
and how it could, how it's slightly different than a traditional institution, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I, I did not know that. Um, and when you say Leanne, you're referring to Leanne Redmond, right? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yes. No, no, that's, that's what I thought. So uh, Leanne is um, the chair of our maternal, perinatal and pediatric risks. So she's, uh, you know, in a volunteer leadership capacity with ASN, and yep. she does a great job leading that group, um, which kind of is a perfect segue into my next question. Um, are there any leadership or volunteer roles that you have served within ASN? And uh, if you want to expand on any of those uh, specific roles, feel free. I think I've, been, um, I've participated actively throughout. Um, I can't uh, remember a lot of specific roles, but I've been a member of the um, Young Professionals uh, group. I was, a I was the chair of the Energy and Macronutrient Risks, and, I and I'm currently on the um, 2021 um, Nutrition Programming Committee. So those are just kind of a flavor of some of the uh, prior and current roles that I've had on top of others. Um, so I've been a, a member of the um, ASN community and an active member for a long time. Yep. That sounds great. Um, what did you find, what was your favorite thing about serving in a uh, volunteer leadership capacity or what was the most beneficial thing from those positions? I know you said you're on the uh, scientific programming committee. So getting a sneak peek maybe at some of the content for our meetings, you know, can, can be beneficial as enticing or, or enticing, but what, uh, what was your favorite thing about serving in those positions? Well, I think it's, um, it, it, it's a multitude of things, right? It's about uh, helping the society, but it's it, but then it's also mutually beneficial because I think one of the other exciting parts is getting to meet the other members, and you get to meet them in a different capacity when you serve these roles, um, and you and um, and in people you may or may not necessarily interact with on a daily basis because the ASN has a pretty um, it has a fairly broad uh, membership. And so these people that you uh, may or may not have heard of, and they're, uni they're people that you may or may not have run into on a more uh, daily, normal or daily basis. It may, you may have read their papers, maybe not. So by uh, engaging with them, you get to uh, see different perspectives within the nutritional realm and uh, world. Absolutely. And that, that networking and collaboration component is uh, absolutely crucial to just the enjoyment and the success and the advancement of you know, one's career. So. We love to hear that. Um, it is. What what obstacles, if any, have you experienced, and how did you overcome them? Well, anybody that is in academia has uh, encountered obstacles, um, but I think one of the big ones is, you know, throughout your career, you have different different obstacles, um, and it just depends where you're at on your career path, and then where you, um, what your particular obstacles are. I mean. We, we all face obstacles with work-life balance. We all face obstacles with um, getting our grants funded um, with a variety of different things. And um, it, it's all about striking a, a happy medium um, amongst everyone, right? So I think that's really, um, with grants, we just continue to, um, to write them to the best of our ability, submit them and hope they get funded. So th that one is just, just the part of the daily grind. Same with uh, sometimes manuscripts if they're not accepted. And then the other obstacles, we just do um, seek to do our best to overcome them, if that makes sense. And then I think that's where lots of either your collaborators or your network comes into play is to try to um, inform your decisions to make your, to lessen your obstacles. If that makes sense is, you know, part of the good thing about being a member of ASN or being a member of the uh, Pennington, um, biomedical faculty is knowing all the people, being able to network and being able to um, them to better understand your obstacles and them to uh, help have others help you um, try to see the best path forward or at least um, engage them to see what they may recommend or what, what their suggestions may be. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. The teamwork and kind of shared experiences, uh, yeah. you know, between the faculty and, and staff, I, I think that's yeah. crucial too like you said, minimizing those obstacles. And if there is something, you know, knowing exactly what it takes to overcome it. So that's wonderful. Um, now, looking back, you know, 15 years ago, is there any advice you wish you could give yourself back then that you now know? Oh, there's a lot. Uh, I think, I think no one, well, I won't say no one. I certainly didn't quite understand or know what I was getting into with academia. Um, so I think, it was it was a little bit more uh, it was a little bit different than I was expecting, but in in good ways and bad ways. 
uh, you know, it, it, like anything, there were uh, a lot of different things. It's really kind of, I um, didn't quite um, know, I guess that's in my career stage now, I didn't know um, how much of running a small business it really is, having your own lab, um, getting these balance sheets and budgets and all these different things um, on a regular basis and to do all these different aspects and all the paperwork is a lot. I came in, you know, everybody comes into, um, well, I won't say everyone, a lot of people come into academia for the research aspects and those types of things. But I think the farther that you move up the ladder, the less and less uh, hands-on you are, which is slightly different. And you're doing a lot of grant writing and manuscript writing and things like that. So I think it's just being cognizant of um, what actual day-to-day -day things um, professors are doing um, and, and putting a, a close eye on that uh, it would have been would be beneficial um, some years ago and just to um, also to kind of enjoy the ride because you know your goal is always to get to the next step if you will um, so you know your goal is first graduation then to get to postdoc fellowship then to get your first job then to get but you know what each step has its own um, positives and I think it's really uh, important to you know you have a great network and great friendship and your graduate training, it's, it's unique. Um, and then you have your postdoctoral fellowship where you really don't have quite as many um, service and other um, parts that you need to do and you're just writing manuscripts and grants and things like that. So it's more of a peer research aspect. But I think there, so I think there's a lot of different um, benefits to each stage and kind of just taking it all in as you go, if you will, instead of always thinking about the future and your next step and where to go next. That's awesome. That's great advice. Be present and enjoy the moment. And, yep. um, you know, the, the evolution of responsibilities will come as you noted, right? It, it definitely will. And the funny thing is the farther up you get, it, I mean, you can make suggestions, but there's no, there's no, uh, you don't know. I think that's why it's so important to have um, many collaborators and many different, um, advisors because no one ha no one knows what the future holds and so everyone can give you their suggestion or their thoughts but their thoughts and their suggestions um they're doing probably the best their ability to um, guide you but no, no one knows for sure what the future holds or what the next best experiment is so um you know if you're dead set on something also um always consider that because you may be right uh, we we as a staff can't wait to get back to our in-person meeting. Um, we were really fortunate enough last year for Nutrition 2020 Live Online to uh, host that for free virtually. And, um, you know, the, the choice to go virtual this year, I think, is still it's the right decision. However, uh, and I, I think I speak for a lot of the um, members as well. We, we really want to get that in-person feeling and just the energy and, you know, having to do a million things from a staff viewpoint, but it's all so much fun because the energy is so great. And that's what we're really looking forward to in 2022. I think everybody's looking forward to uh, seeing their colleagues again, seeing the energy and just being able to interact in person because it's very different no matter how we try. I think the good news is um, we're just discussing with a postdoc earlier today, one of the good things is I think there's a lot of positives with the virtual as well, because I think collaborations and when people move, it'll be a lot easier to continue the, the virtual encounters or at least keep things virtual while do also doing in person. So I think there are positives, but ultimately, I think we all want to see each other in person and it creates a different dynamic and a different excitement, as you said, and hopefully more idea generation, more, you know, grants and manuscripts, just more out all the different types of things such as that absolutely and that's what we want to, we want to find that perfect balance between the accessibility of a virtual event and the excitement the collaboration uh, of a live event so that's that's something that we got our thinking hats on and i think um you know with the wonderful staff at asn we will uh, successfully okay. navigate that um future scientists any words of encouragement um to the future scientists the next generation of scientists what what do you have to say to those people future um good luck no um <laughs> well said brief to the point <laughs> and, uh, it, 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 with a little bit of humor a little bit of not um but it, it's one of those things it's uh um i, I think it's, i think it's so exciting to think about all the um practicalities of the future right i mean like they're trying to do everything from machine learning and personalized medicine and 
all these different things. And you think of the major scientific breakthroughs that have occurred in the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And you think of the possibilities of the next 20, 40 years. And I think that's really, um, you know, the next the next person that's going to win the Nobel Prize or that's going to um, win other famous prizes or take fu future leaps is is out there and they're a student now. And we may have the ability to um, guide them through mentorship and they have the ability to make to make uh, life changing, um, you know, uh, findings and discoveries. I really think um, those possibilities are there for everyone. And I think that's why you become a scientist. Yeah, wonderful, well, well said. I think I should mention too that um, I am married, I have a wife. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's important, especially when people are talking about where I balance and 12 year old son. And so um, they help keep me balanced, but also on my toes um, because you know the more, the more family uh, responsibilities you have, the more, um, but everybody has something going on in their lives. I think that's something to be cognizant of as well in academia with us being pulled in a variety of different directions. Um, it's just one of those things that we, we, we have a lot of possibilities and sometimes we uh, struggle to stay focused, if you will. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, with the work-life balance, the family balance, it's, uh, it's essential to progressing in all of those areas. So if one is neglected, then I think, um, really nothing moves forward. So what about, what about your hobbies? What do you like to do for fun? Um, you know, what's a perfect weekend look like for you? Um, not in the lab. <laughs> what did the perfect, well, I this weekend, I don't know. And we're supposed to, uh, my son is on travel soccer. So I'm supposed to, uh, that usually takes up a lot of weekends for me, but optimally, um, I, I love um, sports. So whether um, it's participating in them and doing just, you know, some backyard uh, fun things, doing things, I just, I've always mowed grass even as, an, uh, as a high schooler at a lawn service. So it's one of those things um, I've done. And so I don't mind taking care of the yard work. The other thing I do is I love to um, go to uh, sporting events. So we all, I usually, um, maintain a lot of um, season tickets and those also tickets also are the way to uh, ensure if I have it on my calendar I can't work um, because I have it blocked off so um, when I have certain things we have things blocked off now I'm trying to I'm looking forward to uh, Broadway coming back uh, online um, at post-COVID getting back to uh, New Orleans and going to the Singer Theater and things like that as well so I guess a lot a variety of different things I don't have any not like a chef or anything like that, but um, just like to uh, get out of the lab, have fun with the family and stuff like that. Um, any other final words or just anything you want to say? I like how you threw the part in about, uh, you know, being married with your uh, 12 year old son playing soccer. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the interesting stuff. You know, you're, you are a person too. So, you know, um, yep. <laughs> a nutrition scientist at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. That's just, you know, who you are, what, 10, 10 hours of the day sometime. You also have another identity. So I really appreciate oh, you sharing 12. that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I was trying to not make you think like, oh, sometimes it's 14 hours. <laughs> That's the truth. But yeah, no, it, it is. And I'm trying to think if there's anything like overarching. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, let's see. Um, I think that's probably, uh, probably does most of it. Um, Oh, and that's, oh, that's the only other thing is when you see someone in the field or you see someone older, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a hard stop, um, but, you know, in different things. But I think the other thing is, I think most people and most uh, researchers while busy are more than willing to uh, help out or talk to a wide variety of um, researchers or individuals. Um, I think don't hesitate to ever reach out or ask questions or um, for anything, if that makes sense. Awesome. So I am back. This is real time Griff. That was recording Griff there. As you can tell, the beard is growing a little bit more. So I got to clean it up soon. But um, yeah, that was I thought that was a great first interview, John. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you that day. Um, I'll open it up now for any questions, um, comments, or just anything that grabbed your attention. Um, feel free to uh, just, I don't really have a way to um, chart who wants to go, but feel free to open it up for an open dialogue. <laughs> So I'll start uh, first, if that's all right. Um, hi, Dr. Appleson. I'm Samara, a new postdoc at uh, UC Irvine in the Blumberg Laboratory. 
and a student interest group executive committee member. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to do this. It's always interesting to uh, hear other people's stories. And um, I just wanted to have a question, uh, kind of. So while stalking you online, I saw that you incorporate all ages into your intervention studies, which I thought was really cool because some people I talk to, they specifically work with adults and others with children, and it always uh, leaves a little bit of a gap in getting both sides on board. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. And I was wondering, uh, my first part of my question is if you experience different challenges with those different groups or if you are approaching them together in your intervention studies, like both the children and their parents at the same time. So yes, I'm, uh, I've started to do a lot of intervention work and we've done, like you said, we've done three to six-year-olds um, in the drive study. We've done um, pretty much all adults in uh, primary care in the Propel study. Now we have two ongoing um, with uh, Dr. Leon Redmond with um, one's um, in uh, WIC clinics and that's, and then the other one is here at the center and more of a uh, academic uh, question rather than a pragmatic trial. So those are just some of the sprinklings I've done in lots of them, especially um, moms with children uh, the, one of the first things that I initially say is usually you have to bring in, it's for the individual, but you generally have to bring in the family because you can't usually do things without, it in, if you have a mom or a unit leader like that, you generally can't do things independent. Now that's the focus of the trial, of course. So that's, that's really what you have to, um, if that's your primary aim, that's what you really have to go after. But at the same time, you usually can't not discuss or not focus, um, lots of these other aspects. That being said, lots, one of the bigger things that we encounter is um, differences in SES. And so while that is big, usually um, lots of the other things that we incorporate uh, involve a wide variety of um, different um, backgrounds. And that, that's probably the other thing that plays a huge role in our uh, work, especially here in Louisiana, where we have a variety of health disparities. Those are the, the two biggest things that probably come into play when we're uh, working with individuals. Interesting. Thank you so much. The other part of the question that I have is, uh, so I, I work now, uh, my graduate work was understanding how diet impacts transgenerational inheritance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the work I now do with Bruce Blumberg uh, incorporates his obesogen, transgenerational obesogen exposure combined with dietary uh, exposure. So my second question is, do you, uh, is these, so of course, obesogens are everywhere all around us and uh, something we're constantly exposed to. And so do you, is um, avoiding some of those types of materials, uh, the really common ones, like maybe plastics or certain types of cooking uh, containers, is that something that's ever advised uh, to avoid at this stage? Or do you first see that being something that in the future uh, participants in these type of intervention studies would be advised to avoid? It's a difficult question because I think it comes again, um, I would imagine that UC Irvine, you may or may not, it depends on the patient population a lot. Lots of the times, um, we're, we're just trying to get people um, through the basics. And lots of times, especially be it a WIC population or an underserved population or things like that, th that would be, I'm not saying it's not on the radar, but that's probably, f it, at the time, it's probably um, not our first, one of our initial intervention targets. But when you have um, different study populations or people that are more well off, they can afford uh, to purchase new things or can, um, can alter these things and have a little bit more, um, have more spending money, then that, if, if you're not providing it as a um, study product, then yes, if that makes sense. So I'm definitely, I would definitely be a proponent of it if it's, if it's possible for the individual. Excellent, thank you so much. The other, one of the biggest things probably different than, uh, I'm sure you see Irvine, you're probably in the same, but lots of the other uh, people, I mean, I'm pretty much the biomedical research center, which is pretty much similar to a medical center. So pretty much all I do is write grants. I don't teach courses. I don't do any of those other things. So that's probably one of the bigger differences between me and so, so depending on where you're at, if you're at a more traditional academic institution. 
Definitely. Thank you. Hi, um, I have another question now. Uh, my name is Caitlin Sinkus. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Alabama. And I work with the obesity RIS and nutrition translation RIS for ASN. Um, so I'm curious about your postdoc you mentioned was more basic science focused, mm -hmm. but now you're pursuing more translational based research. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how has your role on that team or the research team changed? Are you more having a hand in the community or do you still have some of that basic science involvement and, and how, just how has that evolved over time? With honesty, I really don't do too much basic science. It really has kind of dropped off. It was, it's, I could go in, I could go for a long time on that topic, but it, it was one of those things. You want to get a variety of opinions, but is someone, if you've done more of a human clinical um, PhD and you want it more and you want to try to get a job, uh, hindsight's 2020, but I would recommend doing a human clinical um, postdoc to try to leverage yourself into a human clinical um, job, if that makes sense. It's one of those things. Um, it, it's a hard sell for any um, job, you know, committee to see, oh, you've done human clinical, oh, if you've done basic science, you're going to do both in when you're just an assistant professor and make tenure. And it's one of those things. Um, at least me personally, they struggled to see when I was initially doing my um, job talks, chalk talks, things like that. So if I, I wouldn't say it was a great experience for me and I learned a lot, but especially as, as you're going for your jobs, I don't know, you don't want to span yourself too thin and you want to stay targeted so you can be the per, you know, the, so that you can have your niche when you go and you can go up for tenure, if that makes sense. So yes, I did it, but I don't know if I would recommend it to others. Thank you for that advice. Definitely helpful at this point in my, my academic stage moving. I'll be graduating next year, hopefully, and kind of trying to decide which type of postdoc to pursue at this point. If you pursue that postdoc, it works. You just have to ensure that when you go for your job, you're going to just say, I'm pretty much scratching clinical research um, and, you know, for the time being, and then be going to become a, a basic scientist. You, um, and that's really going to be the pathway that, I, the, and that's how I'm going to make, you know, a, associate and tenure at your, at the, your institution. Thank you. That's at least for me, that's what I would do if I, if I had it all to do it over again. Can I ask a career related question? Uh, so again, first, thanks for your time, sir. Uh, really appreciate it, you and Griff. Uh, this was very nice for you guys to block this off. Uh, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm studying under Dr. Claire Berryman at Florida State University. So she's past chair of the energy and macronutrient uh, risk. Um, so my question is what, what drew you to Pennington originally uh, instead of kind of a, a more traditional academic route? And then would you be able to talk on the, the tenure track at Pennington or like how, how promotions work at Pennington because it's a little bit different than other institutions. Dan, um, so, oh, you're gonna have to do one question at a time. Sorry. What was the first question before tenure? What drew you, what drew you to Pennington oh, what drew initially? You to so going back to Caitlin's good question, I did, as I said, I did a basic science postdoc, but then when I did my initial job interviews, um, I did, what happened was I said I wanted to do both and they didn't go well, let's put it that way. Um, and so what happened is I had, I did a second postdoc. And so that's how I actually ended up here is doing a human clinical postdoc at Pennington. And then I have actually carried on then for the last X number of years and uh, knock on wood should be carrying on for a long time because so th this year and last year have been really good to me for grants. So I've been very lucky and fortunate. Um, but it was, like I said, it wasn't in, in an intended consequence. It was one of those things where um, I did my initial postdoc. I was hoping to get a job. It didn't work out that way. There's probably more of us out there than you realize when you really start to talk to people. Um, some people I know um, even they have gone on something like 30, 40 interviews. Uh, they may not tell you that outright, but there's 
there's more I think there's more struggles getting uh, jobs I'm sure you're probably aware of it but some people don't just state it outright if that makes sense it's kind of it's like certain certain other things in life it's not always ah, you don't want to say you don't want to talk about your failures if that makes sense um, so that's how I actually ended here but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise it's just one of those things that's worked out and worked out well for me um, I came on as a human clinical researcher then because that's really what I after working with animals, that's what I knew I wanted to do for sure. Um, and so that I've just stayed on and the tenure process at Pennington is um, is different. <laughs> we, we don't have traditional academic tenure and some of the older faculty don't even, it's kind of one of those things that they could go either way on whether they actually even exists, if that makes sense. Um, so we do have ten, we do have tenure. It's a rolling tenure, much like a USDA center or something like that. So you can get a five-year rolling tenure. But um, how do I, putting it politely, they'll make the years. If you don't have funding, they'll make years four and five not very uh, happy to be here. So you have a, you have a, a little. Even if you have tenure, you have a little bit of a buffer to regain your grants. But I don't know if you really have um, five years, if that makes sense. So um, also in traditional institutions, you generally go up after seven years, medical schools somewhere in between seven and 10 years. It's not quite like that here either. Pretty much the promotion and tenure committee and your supervisor tells you they want to make sure if someone's going up for um, promotion and tenure, you're going to get it here. Um, so it's one of those things kind of at other institutions, you have seven years, it's a yes or no, you can stay or go. Here you can kind of um, plug along for a long time. Um, and you don't, you can stay as an instructor, assistant professor, these different things. The, the, it's more of your uh, supervisor or the promotion and tenure committee pretty much will say yes or no. And then I won't say it's guaranteed after that, but if they recommend you to go up, generally it's a very positive thing and they have um, little to no um, trepidation that you wouldn't become um, promoted, if that makes sense. It does, thank you very much. Hi, John. Thank you for a nice time. I just really enjoyed the interview. And thank you, Griff, as well, for, for putting this on. Um, I have a two part question, but the first one um, we'll just start with that. So, you know, like Samir had already mentioned, by the way, sorry, my name is Bo, I should say, I, one of the outgoing um, at large delegates for the student interest group. But I'm going to be transitioning to the early career uh, leadership as well very soon here. Um, got my PhD at Ohio State. In nutrition science, but um, a lot of basic research as well. And uh, my background is really biochemistry, which I love. Um, as Samir had mentioned with your, some of your research, um, you know, of working with different populations, uh, kids up to adults, um, I was I partic uh, participated in the workshop that the National Academies for Science recently put up about the food and be beverage intake um, of pregnant women as well as children age two to 11, uh, you know, and they were talking about both the pros and the cons for uh, different methodology that you used to assess. And I'm just curious um, as to, for you doing similar work as well in that, like what does the future of that research look like? You know, if you had unlimited resources, like what are some of the things that you'd be able to see to maybe develop a new method or also uh, improve upon existing ones as well? So while I'm thinking about, I'll discuss that in one second. And going back to, I think it was Alan's question as well. I had, just so everyone knows, I had no, when I was sitting in graduate school as a postdoc, I had no intention of ever being in a self money position. This is the exact position I said I would never be in. And this is where I found myself today. So that's, that's a little bit of irony as well. I had no intention of ever uh, being in this position, but that's where I am today. But in, in regards to your actual question, um, that's a great question. So um, my R01 is actually in, we've developed actually several apps, one of them being portion size. And so um, this provides real time feedback as to um, the participants take a picture and then they uh, estimate um, the actual portion size on what's in the uh, photo and it provides real time feedback to the individual. So what we're trying to do is validate that. The other thing um, we validated quickly is just instead of food waste records, um, 
being on paper, kind of like food records, we validated um, this being electronically and via a uh, photo as well. So um, in regards to your question, I think when there's limitless possibilities, um, there really are limitless possibilities. But I think one of the big issues um, that's facing the field at the moment is that we don't um, have the algorithms to be able to detect these um, via machine learning and other things at this time yet, right? So I think um, lots of people bigger than the NIH have tried to put money into this, if that makes sense. Uh, even out in California, some of your um, Silicon Valley companies and things have tried to put money at this, and they really can't crack the code yet between, you know, um, different things that look extremely similar, if that makes sense. And so I think at the moment, probably for the next, we may be kind of, at least for the next 10 years, we're probably in something where it's, it's money's probably going to determine where you want to go in personal preference. So um, the older, older adults still prefer paper. The young, most people prefer electronic, like you're saying. But the problem with electronic is it puts a lot of emphasis on the back end rater. So it's actually uh, kind of an expensive technology, if that makes sense. Um, because our remote food photography or digital photography, those things tend to be a little bit more expensive. And so, and then of course, like food records, ASA 24 tends to be put the onus on the uh, participant, all the uh, time burden on the participant. So for the research team, it's cheaper when you're writing your grants and things like that. So for until we somewhat crack the code on how to do things more um, electronically and be able to um, determine food, uh, determine what the food item is and determine the portion size electronically, it's going to be, um, how I see the future going is kind of in terms of dollars and cents and um, if that and user preference, if that makes sense. Now, hopefully in about 10 years that can change, but I'm not 100% right. sure on that. And one of the reasons I asked that question, like my rationale is, um, jo is it, his name is John Branowski. I, I think maybe I'm butchering that, but um, basically during the, the workshop, I, I titled him as the e-button guy because um, he's working currently with um, engineers. So he's taking a different approach to this. Uh, he's a, um, a psychiatry doctor, by the way. And, and so he's been working with engineers to develop sort of a wearable uh, button, uh, sort of camera that can capture all that information about what you're eating um, and as well as what you're drinking. And just like some of the things with this electronic uh, collection or methodology that you're talking about, I feel like it opens itself up to a lot of ethical or maybe privacy concerns. And I wanted to, to get your thoughts about that as well. It does. It's my understanding a lot of the wearables, they're supposed to be able to blur out um, a lot, some of the background, but I've never uh, specifically seen it. But I think what you'll eventually see is um, some sort of uh, wearable slash, um, I'm not going to say, e similar to an EMA, ecological momentary assessment, where you either have something in like a chewing sensor and or a wristwatch, um, like that Clemson and Adam Hoover and his group, Eric Muth have done and things like that. Something where you'll uh, ta tailor a couple of things together to ensure you get each eating occasion and ensure it's being um, either filmed or um, or to getting a, a photograph of it or something similar to that. But um, yes, I don't know if that would pass muster at our IRB, but it has at several others. And my understanding is there are ways to blur things out and that's how, um, it can go through, but I've never seen the photos and uh, the actual video and see how it, that actually works. But I think it's intriguing and important for the lifetime, uh, the long term. But again, you can see how like a video that would put so much onus and burden on the research group and how the time, all that time would. So when you like, I think of things in terms of grants as much as science. So uh, it, where you would have to budget all that time into your grant. I know I jumped in at the, the tail end of this conversation, but I'm, I'm currently using Diet ID. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a picture-based algorithm application that was created by Dr. David Katz at Yale. And um, it kind of, it doesn't give you as, I guess, like real time. It's not entirely um, similar to like 
NDSR or any of the 24 hour food frequency questionnaires, but it does do a pretty good job of estimating dietary patterns over a longer period of time. Um, and it only takes about five minutes and the participants we've been using it on um, really enjoy it. And so I know it's not necessarily like AI or video, but I know that there are newer applications that are coming out that are um, validated against some of the more traditional dietary intake tools. What's your, what's your population, Marcel? So um, I'm at UC Davis, but I'm doing research in individuals of varying food security statuses. So um, we have a variety of races, ethnicities. Um, Davis is a Hispanic serving institution that also has a pretty large international student population. Um, and I'm looking at 600 participants. So it is a, a pretty diverse population. Um, and there's been some questions about cultural foods not being included in the application. And um, luckily I'm collaborating with Diet ID and hoping to get a little bit more cultural diversity represented on the, on the tool. Cause there is some that are just a little bit more um, focused on, on Western dietary patterns instead of being a little bit more culturally relevant. I tend to work at the more meal by meal snack level um, more than like similar to like the food frequency questionnaire uh, electron type things. So I think that's one of the slight differences. I have a follow up question to the discussion of the app. I'm sorry, my uh, camera is not working today, but I'm curious, um, you know, you've branched into this M health world quite a bit and I'm yep. wondering what your role is in like the development of these apps and other novel devices versus like who you partner with to kind of build them out physically. Um, I do no programming. I am a nutrition scientist. Um, but that being said, you kind of become QC, especially during your earlier career work, because um, you're kind of stuck doing that, right? Um, it's kind of part of the process, uh, especially getting things done. We always say it's going to be the onus is on the programmer, but in the end, um, it, com it kind of falls back on you. So I don't do any of the actual programming, but I regularly test the apps. I'm all, you know, I'm always, I'm not going to say I'm always using them, but I'm frequently using them, double checking them. Each iOS update that comes out, you're just double checking it. And if not, your participants will let you know when it doesn't work. Um, we're kind of switching things um, currently to go into something into different devices so that it'll be available on Droid and Apple. But traditionally, Droid's kind of been the wild, wild west and it hasn't been as user friendly. And we predominantly just done Apple apps, but it really it, it, it struggles because of, again, um, SES concerns is um, Apple tends to be middle class and, you know, upper middle class, whereas Droid tends to more span the gamut. Um, so it's really important to try to get these other devices and tools to have our apps on them so we can ensure that we're getting the um, all patient populations included in our studies over the longer term. So in a, in a nutshell, I don't do any of the direct programming, but I'm constantly QCing, if that makes sense. Okay, awesome, thank you. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Kara Ruggiero and I'm a fourth year PhD student at Penn State and I'm working with the Maternal, Perinatal and Pediatric RIS this year. So got to meet Leanne, which has been really great working with her. I'm gonna ask another question, John. It's not related to your research. I'm just always curious as to when I meet people and I like to ask them this question. So who's one person that's influenced your career or maybe your personal life uh, the most? And, you know, why do you think that they're, you know, they're on that list of people that uh, are influential for you? One person. I don't know if there's been one person. Um, overall, it's probably been my family uh, has been probably the most. And then, of course, you also have all your support from your advisors and mentors. So those would probably be one and two. I don't know, like, you know, from a young age, you have your parents, then uh, you get, then you get married and then you have, I have a, you know, a, a son. And I think all of them have played a role and got, you know, and helped me bring um, where I am. And then as well as then all, all the mentorship that I've received through my uh, career. So I probably didn't accurately ask your answer your question, but it's probably kind of those two angles, if that makes sense. I kind of have a question and again I jumped in late so I'm sorry if I, I missed um, anything that was already discussed but um, I'm kind of really interested in the translational aspect of an app or a, an, 
a food based tracking tool like yours in terms of it being used to inform nutrition policy. Um, specifically, I'm interested in nutrition in schools, whether that's at the elementary, high, secondary, or, or collegiate level. And so, do you think, um, kind of long term, are there any ways that you see this application being integrated into um, planning school meals or um, kind of any changes in, in policy like that? We could discuss this for a long time. I think one of the things, the biggest things is it kind of goes back to, um, well, it kind of goes back to the money question, right? And then the user burden question. And I think kind of going back to that statement, I think long term, we're going to kind of like going back to diet ID, how accurate do you want your data? How much time burden do you want on the participant? And then how, and then it's going to be, it's kind of going to be a flow from there, if that makes sense. It, is that is that enough or do you want an actual meal by meal level and then do you want the meal by meal scored by the individual which is kind of the point of the, our the portion size app because it provides real-time feedback and then also it puts the user burden on the individual so there's no um, scoring done by lab members and things like that or do you want it sent off and scored by an rd and things like that and so i think eventually like i said we'll get to the ai and things like that hopefully as as things continue but I don't think, like you see, even with diet ID and things like that, it, it's a rough estimate. And I think that's where most things are. It's still a rough estimate as opposed to um, an accurate estimate. And I think, but in 10 years, we can probably get there, hopefully, maybe longer. Awesome. Well, it looks like we are approaching two o'clock. Um, everyone, I think, got a question in. So if there are no more questions or comments, we can go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I just want to I thank John many times. I just want to thank you all as well for joining and not just for joining, but also for the role you've played within ASN uh, and the leadership capacity for your uh, research interest section. And, you know, just the young leaders like you all are what we look forward to as an organization, seeing you progress in your career and um, continue to uh, volunteer well, within ASN and make our society even better. So thank you all for the hard work.